It's The Journey with drug and alcohol attorney Mark G. Aster. Okay, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Journey Live. You'll be able to watch us on Facebook on drug and alcohol Tony's uh, Facebook page and also my personal uh, Facebook page and YouTube and LinkedIn and uh, drug and alcohol I think just about everywhere we can possibly post it we've been posting it so I'm super super excited to have uh, James Sweezy on on our show with us and it's interesting because you and I never met but this is like the second time we've done done something like this together yeah so we did uh, recovery radio we in did the past, and I was patched in from Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm at right now, to Fort Lauderdale. So I would have been on a screen, kind of the uh, Max Headroom thing. Yes. The, the, the talking head on the wall I, where I was at. A mutual friend, uh, Blake, had been uh, very gracious and invited me to come on the show. And then all of a sudden, while I was there, you you sort of uh, popped in and it was uh, it was cool. It was a very cool experience. So I'm, uh, Yeah, we had a good time. We had a good time with that. It, uh, and we were lucky to have that studio and that environment to work in. But unfortunately... Um, we were one of the first, I think, one of the first radio broadcasts of the recovery community, and it didn't catch on as quickly as we would like, and it's very difficult to uh, find advertisers and things like that for for that type of program. Yeah, well, this is something you know I sort of do on a weekly basis, and uh, I really enjoy doing, and anytime I meet somebody that I, that I really think can, can is helping people and has just an interesting story to share, I always love to get him on the show, so I, I've sort of had it in the back of my mind to get you on, and then we sort of reconnected, late, uh, you know, what was it, a couple of weeks ago over a potential case, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, i got to get James on the show. It's time. So I'm really thankful and grateful that you could take a little time to chat with us. I'm glad to be here. That's a pleasure to mine. So so let's go back a little bit in time, because I know well, you, were, you were born and raised in Kentucky, right? That's right, Louisville, Kentucky, and I and a and an outer lying area of, of Louisville, Kentucky, about thirty minutes out, Bullet County, because my parents were separated. So my mother lived in the closer to the inner city, and my father kind of stuck to the country. So you know, every time I hear any time I hear somebody mention Kentucky, I always think about Casey's Law, because you have that you have Casey's Law up there, which is sort of the the only thing that even remotely looks like the Marchman Act that we have down here. So, yeah. So uh, the lady that started Casey's Law. Uh, I've actually had the uh, privilege of hearing her speak, and I met her. And what it was is, uh, as you know, we deal with in addiction recovery, right? It's the the person is mo usually the addict is not ready to go. They're not ready to go to treatment. They're not ready to go to detox or any type of recovery program. They always have this delusion in their mind that I'll go fix this if I could just get a good job. I'm sorry, my cat is climbing. Don't worry, oh, we, we we like animals. We like animals on the journey. It's okay. It's all good. <laughs> so um, anyway, as you know, the the addict is always they always think there's something better, something better. I'm going to figure this out myself. And what happened with her son Casey is that they kept trying. They kept going to hospitals, treatment centers, the police. And they get the same answer that most people get now is just you have to wait till they're ready. They have to bottom out first, right? That's that's the big thing. I'm a 12 step guy. And if the person doesn't want to go, it's very difficult to get them in. Of course, now we have all these different methods, uh, interventions, the Marchman Act that you all use, Casey's Law. So that's why she started Casey's Law is because um, they kept trying and nobody would court order Casey to treatment. And he ended up passing away. So his mother... Uh, created Casey's law. Yeah, and, and I always sort of, you know, when people say to me, they talk about rock bottom, I'm like, well, the problem with rock bottom is the person may be dead. I mean, you know, this is the times we live in where, you know, a lot of the drugs are laced with fentanyl and it doesn't take a whole lot and um, that's right. someone's going to the emergency room. Well, part of the, part of the deal uh, with doing interventions and doing what we do is I always, when I uh, come on my page, you know, 115,000 subscribers now, something like that, pushing, you know, pushing towards the 120 mark. I and then the it. other platform, that's just on Facebook. There's other platforms with smaller. But anyway, um, I talk to a lot of people. And what I, especially when I'm dealing with parents, I'm always looking for leverage, right? Um, it does, do you pay their phone bill? Do you pay for their car? How much money do you give them a day? Do you let them live in your house? I'm always looking for that leverage because if I can use that leverage, then my bottom might not be death. We might be able to create a false bottom for them. Right. Well, and one of the one of the one of the one of the tactics you use uh, in, in an intervention is to put all their clothes in a garbage bag. Right. Fill up their all their belongings in a garbage bag and then put a really nice suitcase right next to it with clean socks and uh, deodorant and things like that. A nice. And then you give them the option after the intervention that you can drag that garbage bag down to the local homeless shelter, down to the Salvation Army or something or a tent city and go live there, or you can take your stuff and put it in the nice suitcase and come with me like an adult, and let's go fix this the right way. Right. So, so it gives you leverage, you know. 
I love it. So, you know, I went to your website, jameswincy.com, and I see that you're an interventionist, you create content, you publicly speak to, to you know, to audiences and stuff. So I want to talk about all that because that's really important. Um, but I want to know how, how you got started on this because I know there's a story behind this and you you shared it with me briefly this morning, but it's really, uh, it's really sort of a, I don't know, a story of resurrection. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah. maybe we can, we can sort of go back to the beginning and just talk about, you know, what life was like growing up as a kid and how you ended up sort of, you know, going off on a tangent before you got, you know, straight and, how, you know, where you are now. Well, life growing up as a kid, right? Like, I, I was privileged. I had all the good stuff that anybody would want to have a great mother, a great father. Um, they were separated. Though, and I'm an only child, right? I'm, a, uh, I'm an only, I have step siblings, but I'm an only child to my mother and my father. And I learned at a very young age how I could play one against the other. If I wasn't getting the answer or the results I wanted out of my father, I could turn around and go to my mother and vice versa. And that pretty much defined my childhood, whether I'm living with mom or dad at the time. And that was very contingent upon my behavior. You know, there were times my mother would say, you're going to live with your father. We're going to straighten you out. You know, um, I, I'm a 12-step guy, and some 12-step literature talks about that, the geographical pure. If we could just get you out of the inner city of Louisville and go out in the country, things will be better. But um, looking back on it now, Mark, you know, I didn't know this at the time, but I am restless, irritable, and discontented by nature. That's what's wrong with me. And that was a, a big thing of my recovery is someone teaching me what exactly was wrong with me. And the reason I'm restless, irritable, and discontented is because of low dopamine in my brain, like the feel-good fluid that everybody, uh, that everybody when, when you see your kids or when you see your wife or when someone tells a joke, there's this feel-good fluid, a chemical reaction of dopamine that causes you to laugh or be happy. Well, being naturally low on that, on that fluid, that dopamine, um, causes me to be restless, irritable, and discontented. And looking back on it throughout my life, um, I never really got along with people. I did not like school. I was socially awkward. But um, my point is that I, I was privileged, though. I had every opportunity um, that was available. So I got a question. When you say that you had low dopamine, is it, so when people say that, you know, that the substance use, especially substance use, I'm sorry, substance use is a, is a brain disease. Is that what they're talking about? I mean, maybe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, the, you know, um, of course, we go back to that old argument of uh, is addiction a disease or not? That's a big argument online that I don't really participate in anymore. I have my belief system and I'm meant to attract people to me. So who cares whether it really is or not? But it was a big deal for me to learn about that. So um, the definition of the word disease is a disorder of function in a plant or an animal. And if you want to see a disorder of function, look at someone three or four days off of Suboxone, methadone, heroin, something or day two off of a very heavy alcohol habit or a very heavy benzodiazepine or opiate habit. Look at them. You will see a disorder of function. You will see sweating, leg cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, you name it. Okay, so we have this, uh, it, it, it's defined as a disorder of function. And that disorder is uh, the way it was taught to me by a doctor at the local recovery center here that teach, he teaches classes there was that we are a court low on dopamine, right? Is that, and I equate is that, that, is to, that consistent with every, with everybody that has the, that's dealing with addiction? Is that consistent? I, you know, I, I, I think so, I'm thinking but there's would, also other issues, right? There's other issues. Uh, the, the 12 step community calls them outside issues. There's other issues, other traumas, other things that could happen in life, uh, that will cause you to want to use, or you can use an excuse to use. Uh, they might not be necessarily uh, because of your low dopamine. People that have been sexually abused, people that have been raped, that obviously causes a lot of trauma. And the way I understand it, I'm not a medical professional in any way, that trauma at a very young age can cause the body, the, uh, the addiction gene. This comes from Dr. Drew Pensky when I met him. Uh, the addiction gene, it, uh, it uh, <laughs> surfaces in times of extreme, like he said, Holocaust-like adversity, right? So whenever you go through some type of trauma, the addiction gene will emerge as a survival gene, right? And, you know, addicts are extremely resourceful people. They, they're able to maintain with no job, no money, homeless, and yet they're at the party with a pocket full of cocaine every night. You so, know what I mean? So I want to tell us about your journey into, into addiction. How did sure. that all start? Say again? How did that all start? <sighs> well, like I said, I, I believe, uh, looking back on it, I was restless, irritable, and discontent for most of my, uh, as long as far back as I can remember. But how it started, how it manifested itself was in the form of me being socially awkward, not being comfortable around people, not enjoying school or being around large groups of people. I isolated a lot. And uh, so, you know, I did, in high school, I, I did okay. Um, 
I had no heavy drug use or heavy alcohol use, anything like that. But as I progressed into college and I started getting out in the community a little bit, um, smoking weed, uh, drinking alcohol became my social coping mechanism to get me over that restless, irritable and discontent. It says in the book, um, we drink purely for the effect. And I use purely for the effect produced by alcohol or narcotics. I didn't particularly like the taste of whiskey. I didn't particularly like the taste of cocaine or anything like that. I used it purely for the effect. And for me, that was overcoming social awkwardness and this <laughs> level of depression that I felt at all times, looking back on it. So the big thing to note is that um, when, when I was in, in my 20s, early 20s, I was in an auto accident. And I had been using – now, I, I don't want to blame the auto accident for anything. I had been using – Alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy at times, things like that. You, t you so talk, I, I remember, this, you t remember you telling yeah. me not to interrupt you. The, 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 the cocaine made you. You said it was the most amazing thing you'd ever tried, right? Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. The, the cocaine was pure euphoria. I went to a concert. I'm, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky at the time, and me and my friends rented a a, a, via, a SUV and we drove up to Chicago to go to a Rage Against the Machine concert of all bands, right? A very high energy, all that. Well, we bought some cocaine on the way. And it wasn't like later in my drug habit where if that cocaine's in the car, I have to snort it or smoke it right there that moment, right? This was, we bought it, we're going to try it while we're up here. We kept it in the car, drove all the way up that to the hotel. Then right before we went to the concert, we all did a line. And I remember pacing around that hotel thinking, I feel amazing. I feel almost godlike. My body was tingling. I was happy. I was smiling. And I was ready to go. Like all the energy in the world. Now, Remember now, looking back on it, see, I was restless, irritable, and discontent. That low dopamine felt like depression. I felt sluggish. I felt socially inadequate at all times. But I snorted that line of cocaine and poured some tequila on the top of it, and I was the man on top of the mountain for a short period of time. I loved it. And we went to that concert, and uh, whenever we left the concert, it was only me and another friend of mine who is actually in recovery right now. They were like, where can we get some more of that? You know what I mean? Well, where can I, how can I feel like that again? So yeah, did he get the, was a, did he get the a, same a response? Thing. Did he get the same reaction in terms of how he felt? Say again. Did he get the same reaction from how? Yeah. He felt? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went to the concert, and my normal friends, uh, it, and I'm glad you're bringing this up because it, it's causing me to realize the other three or four guys that were with us, they're normal now. They've never been to through addiction recovery, through a treatment center. They didn't bottom out and go homeless. Me and that other guy did though, and I won't use his name here, but uh, me and that other guy, we did, and it just so happens that we were the two that after the concert was over and we had that alcohol, but you know, I was quadruple fisted with Corona's in this uh, concert, carrying four of them. Cause I didn't want to walk back to the bar after that concert was over. He and I were the ones, everybody else went back to the hotel, ready to drive back to Louisville the next day. We went out to bars and stayed up all night. And we're trying to think of how can we come up with some cocaine in Chicago when we don't know anybody here. So yeah, that, that other guy, he experienced the same euphoria and the same, uh, we, <laughs> I hate to say it, but we had a great time that night. Okay. So, so when did the, when did the accident happen um, in relation to the, the you know the sort of escalating drug use? Uh, okay, so the accident happened. I was about let's see. At the time, I had already been convicted of a felony, which we'll talk about. I'm sure we'll get to. I'm writing a book about that right now. I'd already been convicted of it um, for trafficking narcotics. The uh, the accident happened when I was about 22 or 23 years old. I, I was working a job. It was one of those moments of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get with my parents. I'm going to clean up. I promise I'll do everything better. I had been working at the time. Um, I was waiting tables and bartending for a very nice place uh, that had insurance and all that. And uh, my parents had decided to help me get a house. And it was actually the day I was supposed to move into the house. I had been out all night the night before partying. And I woke up and I was late to pick up my appliances. My mother's waiting on me at the appliance store, calling me. I had 15 missed text messages. I was like, oh no, I overslept and I had a hangover. So I jumped in my truck and I took off and I'm headed toward to meet my mother and a very large SUV pulled out in front of me, an expedition. You know, one of those, and it was just like a, I was probably going 40 or 50 miles an hour and this lady didn't see me and she pulled right out in front of me like that. It was like a brick wall. Boom. I, I T boned that vehicle, no seat belt on. My face went through the windshield. The truck tumbled over to a ditch, and I was ejected from the truck. Jesus. And, uh, yeah, Amazing so that, that was the – say again? Amazing you weren't killed. I, I'm sorry. I didn't catch it's that. It's amazing you weren't killed. Oh, it, it is. It is. And uh, they said the reason I wasn't killed, part of it maybe, is this was a very small, compact Toyota truck. 
and I'm tall, I'm 6'2", and my chin hit the steering wheel at the same time my forehead hit the windshield. Now, the steering wheel would slip off of my chin and go down here, and the rest of my face did leave a little imprint in the uh, windshield, but both of those hitting at the same time uh, kind of balanced it to where it wouldn't just break my neck in either direction. That's what the doctor said. And it took them about four hours to pick the glass out of my face. You can't really tell right now, but if you and I were in person, if we were up close, I have all of these little marks all over my face. Um, uh, my, my lip had to be sewn back on. It was really bad. So it basically just tore my whole face up to where I needed cosmetic reconstructive surgery. Wow. Yeah. And they gave me a bottle of pills, right? You know, can you imagine my, my face was wrapped up like a mummy with all these bandages and things pushing it down. And uh, I didn't get to move into my house. I went and stayed in my mother's house. I didn't get to move into my new place. And while I was staying there, I was in an extreme amount of pain, a lot of lacerations, stitches inside and outside of my face, all over the place. And I had this bottle of pills that anytime I didn't like the way I felt, that pain started to kick in, I would take three or four of them. And that was my introduction to narcotic opiates, painkillers that had a physically addictive property to them. Okay, but you, you were, but you were also using, you know, other types of drugs as well, right? So yes, yes, alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, ecstasy, if, if that's what was going on at the party that night, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, this was almost icing on the cake for you. Really? No. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I didn't think I had a problem with alcohol or cocaine or I'd never experienced any consequences out of them. I was I think about it, I'm doing alcohol, cocaine. I had a felony for trafficking at the time. I was convicted very young, but um, I had never experienced any real consequences from it, like a DUI or getting caught with cocaine or getting caught, tra uh, you know, uh, other than transporting trafficking marijuana before is what my charge was for. But I just didn't see any of that as a problem. And then when I was introduced, when I through the accident, not the doctor's fault, when I took the narcotic painkillers, I experienced my first time. Uh, experiencing withdrawals and i didn't like that all right you know maybe maybe we can back to it just for a second and talk about sure. the because i know that you you told me an interesting shared an interesting story that you were working in a bar and there was drugs being sold and dealt and and that was what i think led up to the conviction right is that where you got arrested yeah that's right so, that's right though that happened before the car accident right it did yeah right, it so happened before the car accident so this is 19 years old i'm talking about a few years later right with the car accident but uh at 19 years old i remember i was working um i i come out of high school and um, I was supposed to go away to college, but my father and I were arguing at the time over whether I got to take a vehicle or not. And all that. So I didn't end up going to my first semester of college. I went and got a job at the local mall at a shoe store, you know, selling jerseys and shoes. It was cool. We all hung out. It was better than uh, working in a factory somewhere. I got to talk about shoes all day and football or whatever. And um, so I'm working there and it was kind of the thing around town. Uh, me and some of my friends, we would all, get our paychecks or any money we could get our hands on and chip up five or $10 that day and make a pool of money. <coughs> and we would buy alcohol with it and a bag of weed, something like that. And it didn't take me long to realize that um, whoever we were buying it from, they always had money. And I wanted to be that guy. I was like, well, why don't we supply it? If we're out here doing this every day and we're putting 10 or $15 on it, why don't I become a supplier? And so I went to that guy and said, how much to buy in bulk? Things like that. So I started, uh, and I remember thinking, you know, my first day that I had a couple little ounces of weed and I sold off a few bags and made $100 in a matter of a few stops. And I had this realization. I was like, wait a minute. I've been working in the shoe store at, you know, five and a quarter was the minimum wage at the time. Right. So I've been working in the shoe store and I'm thinking I worked an eight hour day and made 40 bucks prior to taxes. So let's call it 30 after. Right. Thirty dollars. Well, I made thirty dollars in one stop at a pay phone over here the other day. Why on earth would I work? I, I considered them chumps. I was like, y'all are delusional working at these pretzel stands and shoe stores or whatever, wherever you work as a, as a kid, car washes. Y'all are ridiculous. Why would you put in eight hours a day when I made more than you with just one phone, one stop at a pay phone? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, that, it's sort of the attractiveness of making all that dough and being, you know, the big man on campus, as it were. Yeah. You know, and it, Mark, it gave me my validation, right? People needed me. People wanted me at their party. They needed to call my phone just to get a bag of weed or now that would later progress into trafficking cocaine and things like that. But, um, but people needed me. My social awkwardness was gone. I always had money. When you stop at the store, you know, I wasn't having to penny pinch through a $5 bill and say, we better save this for tomorrow to my girlfriend or no, I spent a hundred. No problem. Um, going to, 
going to the mall, buying clothes, buying shoes, paying for a car, gas, no problem. Did your parents? Did, you, par- did your parents ever wonder how you were financing your lifestyle? At, well, again, remember what I was telling you. My mother lived in in the city, and my father lived in um in in the outskirts in a place called Bullitt County. And one thing I, I I didn't say in this particular we haven't got to yet is that um my mother worked in a factory, very successful in her own right, and my father is multi millionaire entrepreneur living out here. So if I had a brand new pair of shoes wearing them around my dad, my mother may have got them for me. Or if I had some cash on me and a nice new jacket or something like that, my mother would look at it, well, it's his father. So, you know, I could play off of both of them, new shoes, new clothes, or spending money was, nobody really questioned where it came from, but they did catch on after a period of time, as you can imagine. Okay, so let's talk about, because I know that you told me that you were working in a bar at one point, Mm -hmm. and that was... You, I mean, when it's interesting, you talk about your dad being an entrepreneur. You sort of tallied your entrepreneurial spirit into, you know, what ultimately ended up c- causing you to get arrested. So maybe talk about what was going on in the bar and stuff. Yeah, so I was um, working at a local restaurant. It's actually right up the street from where I'm at right now. I was able to move back and get a home right where I came from now. Um, and we're building a treatment center right up the road. I got a shameless I plug 20 minutes from here that we're plug working away. on this year. Plug it away. So bring it up. Well, I'm bringing a, uh, my friends and I are bringing a state of the art 25,000 square foot recovery center right here to our hometown. So it's like we were the ones causing the problem. Now we're helping trying to fix it. So pretty I love cool. it. But um, so I'm, I'm working at this restaurant right up the street. Uh, the building is still there. The particular business that I work for is not in there anymore. And I started waiting tables. Um, it was a condition of, uh, or no, I, I started waiting tables just as my first job. Uh, other than the, the shoe store, and I worked at a car wash once before for short periods of time. This is like my first real job where I'm trying to earn money and work. And basically, what I was doing was I was uh, selling the marijuana. It, it later turned into cocaine as well. Uh, I did more buying of cocaine than selling, but um, I did get into where I try to get a discount, right? Like, you know, you could buy a little quantity, sell half of it, and get your money back. Then I got this free. That's kind of what I did. But I was working and I would roll up, uh, we called them half quarters up here. A lot of people call them eighths. It's three. It's one eighth of an ounce of marijuana. It's in a baggie, it's like a sandwich baggie rolled up about this long, about that big. And I would stuff eight or so in each sock. I'd wear tube socks almost up to my knees and stuff eight or so in each sock. Then I would go into this uh, restaurant bar where I could just tell the people, hey man, stop by the bar. It was nothing. It, you know, you can, you can cause a, a transaction to go on. A guy could walk in, sit down at the bar, order one beer, and then meet me in the bathroom, buy a bag. The other servers that were there, the other bartenders that are making cash as they go along, buy it from you right on the spot. I mean, I had trouble staying stocked. It wasn't like I had to lean over to people I didn't know and say, hey, do you want some weed? No, I'd already had a reputation for this, and everybody knew, and everybody in the restaurant. I I couldn't keep it long enough. I couldn't bring enough with me, put it that way. And that... uh. That restaurant money where you can make $100, $200, sometimes $300 in a day, coupled with a several hundred dollars from selling narcotics out of your sock while you're working, you can see that somebody 23 or you know, good 20 money. Years, 21, 22 years old can um, stack up a lot of money very quickly, having $500 or $1,000 days, things like that. And um, one night, I had, uh, I, I had met some guys that were from Mexico. And that's where I got the marijuana from. And they spoke Spanish. I couldn't understand them when they were on the phones and all that type of stuff. But they, they spoke English as well. So I would just buy it from them. Um, I had gotten into buying quantities of it, a couple pounds at a time. Nothing major, not kingpin stuff, but a couple of pounds. You know, I could buy a couple of pounds of marijuana, put one of them away and not even touch it and sell one and get all my money back. So I had a free pound sitting over here. And that was kind of my business model. And if I couldn't find marijuana... Or work wasn't that great. There was always something to balance the money. But anyway, I was out uh, one night weighing some out at a friend's house. We were weighing out a quantity. I think I got five pounds. I was giving a couple pounds to this guy, a couple pounds to this guy, keeping one or two, whatever it was for myself. And um, while we were in my friend's house, mind you, this my friend's house, but it's his parents' home. They're the ones that own it and live there. They were out of town. We're weighing it out. His brother decides to stop by out of nowhere and check on the house. And his brother was a police officer. (laughs) So I took the pound or uh, it's about a pound and a half that I had there and I threw it all into a backpack and I jumped out his window with a backpack and took off running down the street. And I, I had a cell phone at the time. Very, this is a long time ago when cell phones weren't even uh, that pot. Not everybody had them. I had a cell phone. I called um, my girlfriend at the time. 
she picked me up on a back road off in the woods over here in Kentucky. I jumped in her car, threw the backpack in the back, in the trunk, and we took off. And as we're riding, the plan was, I broke a rule. It's called a rule of the game. Plan was take this quantity home and drop it off. Home, I mean my mother's house, and hide it somewhere. Then we can go out and party and just take a little bit with us. Well, on the way to my house, someone called me from a party and said, hey, I need an eighth. Or it was a small amount. I don't remember exactly. An eighth or a half, something like that. And they said, why don't you swing by the party? I got a sale for you. Come over. We're all over hanging out. And without taking the quantity home, I told her, I said, just hit a left here. Let's go on over to the party. And when I pulled into the party, we pulled in the driveway. Uh, cops came from every direction. Maybe four or five police cars came from every direction. And then the unmistakable light, that high beam light of a helicopter flying over and lighting the whole area. Almost instantly, I knew I was set up by someone. Apparently, your reputation did ultimately precede you. It did. And I don't know if someone else had got caught with something and they're like, I'll, I'll get you somebody that sells or that deals in this. I'll trick them, you know, set them up, whatever. But when I pulled in, literally, they came from every direction. And they, didn't, they weren't harassing the party or the other party goers or anything. They came straight to me. And then that light came on. There was already a helicopter in the air. So it wasn't just coincidence that they're the helicopter was there. Yeah. And uh, they searched the vehicle. I was drinking beer at the time. I had a 22 ounce of uh, beer in the console and uh, they got us out of the car, started asking us both questions separately. And I saw them walk over and have her open the trunk. And she did. And I kind of listened in. They said, what's in the bag? And she said, just my clothes and stuff. And they said, well, let's open it. And I knew right then they unzipped it. There was individual baggies in there, like a box of glad baggies, uh, digital scales, the little small male scales, handheld, male scales, the little uh, metal ones that, you know, whatever. And then um, individual gallon baggies, and then about a pound and a half to two pounds of marijuana in the bag. Some of it already individually bagged where I was at my friend house breaking it down, but I got interrupted. So uh, all of that, a big trafficking case, all zipped up in one, uh, one, one nice package. So what, what also ended up happening to you, James? So I, um, I, I was taken down and I went to court and of course they do this thing where they call dismissed without prejudice. And I thought I won something. I was like, Oh, it's dismissed without prejudice. Great. So I didn't, I ignored the other court dates that came up and said, I'm just it's dismissed. Uh, I went by myself. I didn't want my parents involved. And then I ended up getting something in the mail, something I had to go to court. So I went down there and I found out, well, disp uh, dismissed without prejudice means that they can indict you federally. It was dismissed from the lower court, but without prejudice, something you know more about this than I right. do, but without prejudice meant something like they can reopen it on a bigger level. Am I saying that right? Yeah, something like that. It sounds like they, they just basically said the state's not going to handle it. We'll let the feds deal with it because it's, it's, exactly. it's traffic. So I heard, all I heard, I'm an alcoholic and addict, dude. All I heard was dismissed, right? You figured you had and, a win. Uh, huh? You figured you had a win. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, so I went down to this court date and I walked in, they arraigned me. And they set me up with a court day. And the lawyer that was there that my father and I had found, I went, I asked Dad, I'm going to need help. I'm going to have to go into a federal court now. And this one's upstairs with bigger benches and all the walls are wood. It was a different looking court than the little traffic court that I'd been in previously. Different looking arena. And I go in there and I'll never forget the judge. His name's James Shake. Nice guy. But he, um, we, we go in and the lawyer tells my father and I right then that he wants to go to a suppression hearing. And a suppression hearing basically means this, this is the way he explained it to me. That on the ticket, the original citation, there was no reason why they pulled me over. It was just subject search, found with all this, felony trafficking narcotics. There was no reasoning as why did you pull me over? Did I not use a turn signal? Was I speeding? There was none of that. So the lawyer wanted to go with a suppression hearing where basically all of it can be thrown out because they had no right to stop me. Well, yeah, and very well defined though, my friend. I'm impressed. Right. So that's what that's what we were going to do was a suppression hearing. And uh, that and what I found is that the judge or the jury, whoever would be at this suppression hearing, just would judge. not get to hear what's that it's just going to be the judge. Yeah, it's a, the judge would not get to hear what I was caught with or what my charges are. The only thing that judge was to preside over was whether or not the stop was illegal or legal. Right. And he said and the lawyer said, look, I got someone off a kilo of cocaine. This is not a problem. You had a couple pounds of marijuana. So then he hits me with this. He says, it's going to be five thousand dollars. And this is 20 years ago, mind you. $5,000 is more than it is now. I was like, whoa. Um, so that right there got my father and I arguing very heavily. Now, look, I have a great relationship with him now, but 
got us arguing very heavily where it's like my family's like, oh, we're going to put up this five grand for you. You're going to do everything we say. But see, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent what, by nature. I wasn't listening to Were your to parents, I mean, were they, were they really ticked off with you? I mean, were they? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah, were pissed. really bad. Really bad, man. They got, they had to, when the night I was arrested, they had to watch me on a monitor. On t- uh, You know, you go into court. And instead of marching you out in handcuffs or marching you out, you do in front the first of the judge, appearance. You're on a TV. You're, in, you're still in the in in the basically in the jail there in the courtroom. Yeah. So they're sitting in the courtroom <laughs> around other people, and their their only child pops up on the screen, uh, charged with trafficking narcotics, federal charge. And so anyway, this lawyer is going to go with this suppression hearing idea, and it was five grand. And we started fighting. They were very disappointed in me, and I was very combative with them. Like, why don't you just pay it and shut up and leave me alone? That was my attitude, right? Well, that didn't happen. And we ended up falling out to where I would not talk to my mother or my father surrounding this case. Uh, I would go off and get high. And um, so the court date comes up and I had this brilliant idea. I only had a thousand dollars to my name at the time. I get in my vehicle and go to court by myself with no lawyer. And I'll walk in and I'm <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking in and there's this guy wearing a suit in really bad shape. But he was out of shape. Bad. His shoot, suit was sloppy and all that. I said, are you a lawyer? He said, yes. I said, well, look, I got this court date upstairs. I explained it to him. And I, I had $1,000, mind you, but I needed money. And I said, I've only got $500 that I can give you. Will you help me? And he said, sure. He took the 500 And on the way up to the courtroom, he advised me of this. And this is 100% truth. I stand by this to, to the end. He advised me to plead guilty. And what he told me was, if you plead guilty, the judge will see that you're taking responsibility for what you did. He'll put you on probation, and we'll just get the felony taken off later. That was the conversation we had. And I went, great. I walked in. I pled guilty. I did the whole recording in front of the prosecutor and the table where I stood up by myself and told Judge Shake that uh, I plead guilty. I'm trying to take responsibility for what I did. And he convicted me of a felony. And then we went forward to sentencing, which would come later. Of course, in between that court date and sentencing, I told my parents what I did. And my father lost it. You pled guilty to a felony. It's going to be on your record. And I was like, no, no, the the lawyer said we can get it taken off. That lawyer is, by the way, disbarred now. He's no longer allowed to practice uh, from doing other people this way. And I said, no, no, we'll get it taken off later. No problem. So what we did was, and there's another ironic twist to this. My father hired a friend of his, a lawyer, and had him show up with us at sentencing. That lawyer is actually the one that just got our, uh, our new facility, uh, okay. city council approved. Right. So the same lawyer, 20 years apart. Anyway, he walks in there dressed sharp like a real lawyer, looking like a million bucks, perfect, you know, looked like a real successful lawyer. He comes in and he says, judge, and my whole family's behind me. There's people in the seats there. He says, judge, you can see Mr. Sweezy's father, his mother, his grandparents, his step siblings, they're all here. They're all vowing to help him if you'll give him probation and he's going to turn his life around. And the judge, James Shake, looked at me and he said, I'm going to probate you, but if I see your face again, I will put you in prison for five years. I said, okay. And I turned around and walked out and went straight back to trafficking. So you, so you did the probation. Uh, you did, you continue to traffic. Somehow you were able to get through probation. Yeah. 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 I went, uh, worked that restaurant job. And so I had check stubs to turn in. Uh, I got, uh, I, I switched restaurants and I got promoted to bartender again in a different place. And my PO came to have lunch without telling me. And I didn't know, I did not know I was not allowed to bartend. She came in and she, actually she was being cool. She didn't say anything in front of the restaurant or any people there. But the next time I reported later that month, she was livid. I walked into that room and she slammed a file down on her desk and said, I saw you behind a bar serving alcohol and beer and all this. If I see you doing that again, I'll put you in prison. You'll do the." And I was like, wait a minute, I got promoted to the bar. It's more money. I can't do that. She said, no. You wait tables. If you walk behind that bar, I will put you in prison. And I was just like, dude, you won't even let me advance myself in here. She said, you know, so I had to go to my, that company and tell them, say, listen, guys, I appreciate the promotion to the bar and all, can't do but it. I'm on felony. And they didn't know. They don't run your background. I'm on felony probation. And my PO came in here to have lunch and said, if I walk back there again, she's going to put me in prison. Wow. And luckily they were, they were nice to me. They said, okay, well, you go back to your regular job, and maybe when you get off felony probation, we we'll talk, talk about, about advancing. Right, hold, and, hold on one okay. second. Hold on one second. Jay, are we going to run out of time? We're okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm I'm say, if I'm long-winded, cut me off. No, no, we're, no, no, no. We're good. We're good. We'll make sure we're doing time. So so you, 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 
let's talk, let's move forward a little bit because just the story that you told me earlier about how you ended up getting clean is, I mean, <laughs> they're all great stories. It's going to make a hell of a book. I'll tell you that. You just need to figure and out. We who's can gonna, do it again another time, figure, Mark. We you just can need to do fi- this again. You just need to figure out who's going to play you in the movie because I'm thinking Vin Diesel <laughs> when I look at you. But so so you you get the job. You get done with probation. No violations, even though the trafficking. Or selling continued. is continuing. So, at what point did you did you say, or did you end up, you know, finally getting clean? Because obviously, you're still using, you're on probation, you're selling. Yeah. I mean, it's a miracle well, you didn't end up going to prison for a long time. Well, I can, I can skip a lot of it to, for the time's sake here because a lot of people know what addicts go through, right? We know the process. Uh, so, years of uh, in and out of. Uh, uh, I would go back to court over different things. I got three DUIs after that probation period. I, I now own three of them. And, uh, you know, I started to face consequences for everything I did. And uh, I ended up addicted to heroin, Xanax, methamphetamine, cocaine, alcohol, marijuana, you name it. I am a poly substance abuser. My favorite, my drug of choice is yes. Like, what do you have? Right. All to change the way I feel, that restless, irritable, and discontent state that is me being low on dopamine. So when you continue to use, even after the probation was over, I mean, how'd that affect your family, especially your parents? You know, that thing where they believe what they want to believe, and I had periods of clarity where I was like, okay, I'm in a lockdown. Remember, we get back to the enabling thing again, where it's like, okay, I tap out, I give up, I got a DUI, I promise I'll do good this time. How many times do families allow that to go on and believe in their child of, okay, he says he's going to do it right this time. He went and got a job. He's paid his own rent this month and he's collecting a check. So now what did that, what do families always say? If you go do the right thing, I will help you. And yeah. I played that for years. Well, look, I see, I see that a lot, you know, even with the kids we march for act. And then what happens is, you know, the kids give the parents the guilt trip. You know, here's a parent mm-hmm. trying to save their child who's been dealing with these issues for a long, long time. And then the kid sort of negotiates with the parents and says, I won't do this. You know, I won't go I won't go away for six months to treatment. But, you know, I might be willing to do this. I might be willing to do three months of IOP or whatever it happens to be. That's it. And the parents are like, all right, listen, something's better than nothing. I don't want to fight with my kid. I don't want to have to testify against them. I want this over with. And that's what happens. And ultimately, you know, things go south from there. But it's interesting yeah. that you share that. And uh, the the disease of addiction is so powerful. It'll make the people next to you sick. Right. And that's what happened. I made the people around me sick to where, you know, if if you're worried every night that you're, you're going to get that phone call from your only child or about your only child, that they're dead, that they've overdosed or died or whatever. But let's say instead you get a phone call of, Hey man, I got a job today. You know what I'm saying? Then they go, Oh, great. You're back on track. You have a job. You're so they get on your side again. Right. Because I can show them evidence of me doing things for periods. And now this went in and out through multiple jobs, multiple restaurants, construction companies, you name it. Um, I did all that. And then there was this time where I had been to a form of medical detox, but I didn't do any treatment after that. Right. I was like, if I can just get off of this suboxone, methadone, painkillers, heroin thing where I'm physically addicted. If I can just get through that, I'll never use again because I'll remember this pain, right? That's the delusion of most alcoholics and addicts that if I can just get off of it, I'll never use again. Is that part of the the whole denial thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, but you don't know because you don't have any experience with it. But it says uh, that it's the the heartbreaking of... uh, the heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do it. That's what the book I read said. It says heartbreaking obsession that if I can just get through this one thing right here, I'll never touch it again. And we always find out that that's not true, right? right yeah. One more attempt, one more failure is what the book says, right? So I, I went through this long process. I went to a medical detox, got off and said, I'm done. And um, I came back to Louisville, Kentucky after going to just that short medical detox for a week. And two weeks later, I was back on heroin. I was back to using it because I didn't know that I was restless, irritable, and discontent by nature because I have a low dopamine factor in my brain. I didn't know that at the time. And I just didn't like the way I feel. So I started using. And after a period of running my mother, my father, and my grandmother rampant and hitting each one of them up at different times to make sure I had constant money coming in and all that, they all got on the same page. My aunt that was 28 years sober at the time, she's 20 or 34 years sober now, uh, my aunt got with them and she started giving them some al techniques. Like all of y'all get on the same page. All of you all give him the same answer, this and that. So I'm living in downtown Louisville in this little ratty rented apartment that my mom was paying the rent on. 
And I was calling every other day, somebody asking for money or something. They all got on the same page and cut me off. So what do I do? I immediately go to my chief enabler, not through her fault, but that's what it was. My mother, I call her. I say, mom, uh, I promise I'll get a job next week. I promise I'll do better and this and that. And she gave me the first no of her life. No, I'm not helping you. And I was like, look, rent's due. I'm going to get kicked out. It's freezing cold. I'll be homeless and I don't have any money or any food or whatever. And she said, too bad. And my mother sobbing, my mother crying, tears. My aunt pulls up out in front of that apartment, the one that's 28 years sober, pulls up out in front of that apartment. And I said, they said, there's a homeless shelter down here, recovery program. It's a nine month program. You don't have to work. They feed you. They have clothes. They have everything. Start you all over. Get back on your feet. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. Nine months is too long. And my mother crying on the phone and all that. I said, I tell you what, after some ne tearful negotiations, back and forth, some yelling, things like that. My mother says, um, I, I told my mom, I said, look, I'm starving right now. I'm tired. Will you please order me a pizza from the local pizza joint? Have it delivered, which was a common thing we always did. Please order me a pizza. I'll eat, get some sleep here tonight. And I promise I'll go tomorrow. And in tears, angry and all of that my mother told me no i'm not buying you food i'm not sending you a dollar your grandmother and your father are not going to help you and your aunt's outside so you can either go live in one of those tent cities or sleep under a bridge mind you sobbing tears my mother at this time you can either go live in one of those tent cities or live under a bridge or you can go to this nine month recovery program and do this on your own and get back on your feet and i chose it was, it was January of 2013, freezing cold outside. I don't do too well with the cold. So I chose the place that had a bed and heat. Yeah, maybe to share the, before, before we switch over, share the story that you told me earlier, which was about that you had the $40,000 that you blew through before this took place. Okay, the... Um, the I know we're the, going back to forwards, but you have so many great stories here. I just, people, I'm going to want people to hear these. You mean the, uh, the the money that I got from selling my house and went out of the country? Yeah, wasn't there, you told me there was, an, the, you had $40,000 that you basically blew through in a couple of weeks. Or a couple yeah, of yeah. So um, that's, yeah, I'm trying to be mindful of your time and all okay. that. But, uh, we got time. So while I was doing all this, while I was hooked on Suboxone, hooked on methadone, any opiate that I could get my hand on, um, the house that I had originally lived in, had been sitting for a while. I rented it to my sister. My mother facilitated that so the payment could get made. Well, my mother, my sister wants to move out, whatever. My mother decides she's going to sell it. So she sells it and makes a uh, $40,000 profit off of it, in which I use some of that to travel out of the country and go to a, uh, a place in Central America where I went to what I call a medical detox, but it was not a medical facility. It was just a eyeball game is the name of the substance, a psychoactive substance. Um, and I, for anybody listening to this, I'm not suggesting you use this stuff. I'm not suggesting you leave the country. There's cheaper, better ways to do it right here in the and United States. And it's illegal here as well, I understand. And it's right? illegal. Yeah, that's why I had to leave the country. So I used some of that. And of course, my, my father at this time is flipping out. My mother's scared to death. He's going to a foreign country that I've never been to before. And by this time, I speak a little Spanish now, so I'm feeling comfortable. And a friend of mine vouched for this place and said, dude, I went down and took it. The withdrawal symptoms went away, and I'm great now. He would later end up addicted as well. So I get on a plane. I get a passport. Uh, I get on a plane, and I fly down to San Jose, Costa Rica, and take about an hour and a half ride out to Mercedes, Costa Rica. Uh, and there's a house out there, and they administer me this Ibo game. Okay. The first time I went, it ricocheted right off. Do you, do you drink but, it, or is it injections? How do they? Now, it, it, so, you know, those little self fill capsules that you can buy at the store, the little clear capsules that you pull apart, gel capsules? It was in those. And the way they did it, was they give you a little bit at first, just a little dose, and you take it to see if you have any type of allergic reaction to it. So I took that, and my ears started ringing. And they said, that's normal. It knocks your equilibrium off. So then what they do is they give you a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. They stack it up, and they give you, you know, and then once you feel it in your body, once you feel this chemical taking over, they ask you, they say, are you in withdrawals now? And um, I should have been in withdrawals. I had been 24 hours off of heroin, Suboxone, all that. And the first time I did this, though, man, you, I was on Suboxone and it did not work. I went and did this. That Ibo game bounced right off of me. And they said, dude, we've only had one other failed clean out before. And it was someone that's on Suboxone. So we're not going to take Suboxone clients anymore. And they suggested to me, they said, why don't you go back to the United States and find, and these are Americans, by the way, operating in another country. Um, 
So they said, why don't you go back to the United States, find a sympathetic doctor and have them prescribe you pills that you can take while the Suboxone leaves your system, come back to us and we'll treat you. I did just that, but I did not find a sympathetic doctor. I went on heroin and I used that for 90 days. And where my mother had sold that house, I don't think I told you this before, Mark, where my mother had sold that house, I had that money and I rented one of those in-town suites, right? So I went back, I moved into an in-town suite and did heroin for 90 days, blowing that money left and right, you know, did that for 90 days, uh, went back down to the facility, took the <coughs> Ibogaine dose where they stair stacked it. And then they just handed you a handful of them. I think they gave me six of them. And I took all of them. And 24 hours later, after the e ringing in my ears and the sort of trance state that I went into went away, um, I was up on my feet. I was not experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And they, um, they said, well, congratulations, you're cured. And I took my backpack. I went for a hike in the mountains, came back. And then this is a part, if we have time, Mark, that I didn't get to with you earlier because I, I don't tell the Obligan story too much, but I'll just throw out a disclaimer again. Guys, don't try it. Call Mark. Call me. Call somebody. There's a better way here in the United States. So I decided to leave that treatment center, and I went out um, into the town of San Jose to get a drink because alcohol wasn't my problem. You see, I was over the withdrawals. So now I can do cocaine You're good and to go. alcohol. And You're not addicted weed. anymore. Yeah. No worries. As long as I don't do opiates, I'll be okay, right? So I go, uh, I go into the town of San Jose, Costa Rica, and I start drinking. And the last thing I remember is buying everybody in the bar a shot. It's cheap down there. You know, Patron's a dollar a shot. That's fine. And I remember drinking, and I blacked out. And I have vague memories of passing through the airport. I have vague memories of passing through uh, immigration again. But I went through. I hopped on a plane and went to Nicaragua for no apparent reason other than there was a guy there that was from Nicaragua and he wanted some of that Ibogaine. And I've never told this in my book or online or anywhere before. I smuggled some of those Ibogaine pills to him through the airport because he, he had been to that facility. He went up there and got high and he's like, I need some of those Ibogaine tablets. And the facility gave them to me and I was holding them. I was supposed to deliver them to him sober and say, here, take these to help you, whatever. I did it blacked out drunk. And went to San Jose, or I'm sorry, Managua, Nicaragua, is where I was at, and I blacked out. And yeah, not a good place so, to get caught smuggling drugs into the country. Well, yeah, 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 not good. So what I did was I put them in those little self uh, self filling capsules, and I put them down in a bottle of calcium. You know the calcium tablets you can right. buy at GNC. So they I put know. them down in a bottle of those, shook them up, mixed it in, went on to Nicaragua, and I would later black out while I was in Nicaragua and went on a, a drunken blacked out spree and woke up in somebody's yard that had found me um that's so, not, that whole trip is something we could get into later it's, it's but a, then i it's amazing you're still uh, alive to be quite honest with you oh yeah and then i'm not on that show locked up abroad or anything like that that's what the, the the people that found me drunk it was at a house what they consider a bar down there the way you know if uh, somebody owns a bar is it's just their house up in the woods but they have neon lights and that's how you know they sell alcohol there you know, because this is off in the rainforest almost, you know, very close to the rainforest. It's not like the United States where there's just streets and roads, and dirt roads and all that. And I was drinking at one of these houses and blacked out. And they put me in the backyard in a shed because they didn't want me leaving and getting arrested. So that next morning I got up and uh, I got directions back into the central city of Nicaragua. I got a ride. I went into Nicaragua and uh, I called my grandmother. And asked my grandmother if she would help me. And she's like, well, what are you doing? I was like, I'm in Central America in Nicaragua. And, of course, my 80-year-old grandmother's like, what? What? You know, <coughs> and she bought me a plane ticket back to Louisville, Kentucky, where I would go live in that house where the incident we just talked about took place over the pizza. After years of drug addiction, drug abuse, getting that 40 grand from the sale of my house, using it to go out of the country to take this other drug, Ibogaine, and blowing most of it during that 90 day period and that extended stay, you know what I mean? I landed back in Louisville, Kentucky, broke out of money. Yeah, you know, but I would, while all that's going on, Mark, you know, I'm partying, I'm, I'm big diamond gym, right? I'm, I'm, I'm buying people's bar tabs, I'm buying nice clothes and all that stuff to make me look successful. But uh, after all of that is when my mother came to that moment about the pizza, the pizza she, story. And she just said she was done, done. Done, done, tears in her eyes, Crying, well, you know, I was on the phone with her, but crying, uh, emotionally distraught. She, my mother comments when I talk about this story right here. My mother comments on it online till this day. She'll jump in there so the other people can see, the other parents can see. My mother will say, 
hardest day of my life, best thing I ever did. She'll make comments like that. So other parents can see it, like cut them off. I love you know? it. I love it. So you did, you did the nine months of, of treatment, right? You got clean. Yes. Did you stay clean? Yes, yes, yes. So that was uh, in January. That was December of 2012. Uh, September of 2012 is when I came back from Nicaragua. So between September and New Year's is that period where I was talking about where I was blowing the rest of the money, you know, out running around. It, it only took two weeks after coming back from that detox. I was back bar. on heroin within two weeks. Oh, yeah, full blown drug addiction, drinking alcohol, all that. But uh, my parents live out of state. They live in Florida at this time period. So they didn't see me every day to see it. Um, but as soon as I started calling for money again, they knew what time it was. Oh, pay my rent. Do this for me. Do that. Right. Well, there, where's the 40 grand? I'm like, it's gone. All oh, that's gone. You know, and they knew something was up and that's what caused them to cut me off. But yes, I went into this, uh, detox, non-medical this time. There was no medicine, no doctors, anything like that. And I don't know what happened, Mark. I had that conversation with my mom. Uh, my aunt was out there for 28 years sober. She puts in, you know, as we talked about before, I, I get in the car, I had to choose between Tent City and the bridges in January, freezing cold in Kentucky. I don't do too well in the And cold. you were hungry. Yeah, and hungry, all of that. No money, no nothing. And they, I choose, I said, okay, it, it took a minute. Like you see on the show Intervention where they blip out and everything goes haywire you, first, it, that happened. And then I <laughs> conceded and said, I'll go to this place. I went down there, the homeless shelter slash recovery program. It's not a treatment center. They didn't have clinicians and therapy and all that stuff. It's just a 12 step recovery program built into a homeless shelter. And they dropped me off there. I went in, I checked into detox. And at some point in that detox, see, I used to listen to um, Les Brown and Gary, I still do Gary Vaynerchuk and Tony Robbins, all these people. Yep. And I was like, there was this quote. He said, all of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. And I saw that quote and I'm standing in this recovery center and they're telling you things like this. It's not like private treatment. Well, when you get up and say, I'm leaving to go get drunk, they go, good luck with that. Bye. That's the attitude down here. If you don't want that bed, it's a free bed. Somebody else does. Yep. Be my guest. Go get your butt handed to you again on the streets and we'll be here when you get back. And they look at me and they're like, the door's not locked, buddy. Take off and you're not in prison. And I stood there and I thought, and I was like, I don't have anywhere to go. And that quote was in my head, man, that I'm self-made. The sum total of all the drug connections, all the partying, the business I owned or whatever, the the the, the jobs, all this with my parents, all these thoughts of college and grandeur, and I'm going to be this huge success. The sum, the net result of all of that, the sum total was me with track marks on my arm and not a dollar to my name laying on a bed in a homeless shelter in a non-medical detox, sweating it out. And I had this moment where I stood up and I said, you know what? I'm 36 years old at the time. I'm 42 now. I stood up and I said, I'm going to do everything that these people tell me to get to the end of this. I will complete the nine months all the way through. And, you know, because they always say you, you, the streets will reward your misery. And something happened while I was in there, Mark. You know, it's a God thing. It was through prayers to other people praying for me, whatever you want to call it that switch flipped in my head that this is over. Nobody's going to pay my rent. Nobody's going to give me a job. I have to make this on my own. You took responsibility for your life. That's it. That's it. And uh, what it is, because it's a 12-step based program, there was other guys down there, what they call 12-steppers that had completed in nine months. And they're coming in, they're sharing their experience with you. They're showing you their detox picture, how bad they look. And you see them, they're dressed nice. They have a job. That It gives you hope. That, oh, you were just in here nine months ago in the same shape I am? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, now, but you have your own apartment and you have money and you're driving a car? And they're like, yes. And I, okay, I'm going to do what this guy's doing, whether it kills me or whatever. And, you know, and I made that decision. I said, I, I'm standing in detox. You know, whenever you're in there three days into detox and you're still sweating, you say, I'm completing this. Everybody looks at you like they roll their eyes like, slow down, buddy. Sit down, shut up. You know, and, but I had that mentality. And I said, I don't care what it is. And I called my mother and my father, and I promised them, I said, you all don't worry about me for the next nine months. I don't need nothing. I'll be right here. And they said, well, if you complete, we'll help you. And that they held true to that. I love know? it. So um, so let's fast forward to today because we're running a, a little bit out of time. Because, sure. I mean, you're just a totally different guy now that you were then, and I know you're very well respected. And uh, so I, I, tell me what you're doing now because I know that you're helping a ton of people. I mean, I mean, if you've got all those followers – 
you obviously yeah. doing something right. I mean, that doesn't happen by accident. So let's talk about what you're doing now, and then I want you to you know so give out your information because if people need help, I want them to, sure. to reach out to you. So, uh, do you want to know how it happened? How I got here? Sure. Like a, the short of it, or yeah, let's hear it. Two years sober. Um, uh, have a little baby. Her name's Ashlyn J. Right now, she's uh, five now. Uh, or she, they're three and four. She will be five this year. And then her little sister, Ava Grace, is three right now. So I got a three and a four year old toddler girls right now. Um, Ashlyn had already been born, and Avery, we were pregnant with Avery, Elena and I, my girlfriend, and uh, who I met. She was homeless, broken, the same as me. We met in in recovery. Um, about a year after we met, we started dating. So we already have one baby and we're pregnant with the second one. And I'm working as the head chef of a local, um, Italian restaurant. I've worked in restaurants my whole life and I was working, but I've worked my way up to head chef after about a year. And I'm standing there in the restaurant and I saw someone come in that was still addicted that I knew from one of the clinics and I saw them and they looked terrible. And they were still in the clinic and they were talking babble and I felt better about myself. And they were praising me for having a job, being completely off of the methadone and Suboxone. They were praising me. And I felt this urge, Mark. I was like, you know what? Even if it just helps one person, I'm going to film and tell somebody right now that you can get off dope too. You can get off of Suboxone, methadone, heroin, whatever it is that you're on, whatever it is that you abuse, you can get off of it too. And I made a video and posted it. And it did okay. Got a few views. Then I did a comedy video and posted it and a celebrity shared it uh, a, a guy I happened to know that that got famous on his own he saw me he hadn't seen me in a, years and now here i am popping up on facebook again doing some comedy and he's like he shared it and i woke up the next day with like two million views 1.5 2 million views that's unbelievable and all these people are coming in liking my fam you know my page and all this stuff they're coming in they're liking it and everything and i was like well maybe there's something here and i had so many messages in my inbox i didn't know what to do with them so I'm a 12 step guy. I called my sponsor and I said, Hey man, what do I do? There's 800 people that just asked me for help to get off of dope. What do I do? And he said, well, you can't answer 800 people in a day. He said, why don't you just make another video and answer their most common questions. And then tomorrow make another one and answer their most common questions and they can go watch them. And you know, some will watch some won't whatever, but maybe some people will get some help out of this. And that spiraled into now uh, pushing 120,000 subscribers. Uh, I'm a national outreach coordinator at All In Behavioral Health locations in Fort Lauderdale, Pennsylvania, Jersey. And then um, uh, 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 while I was working at that restaurant, I posted a couple of videos. Here's how I got the job. Um, I answered one of those messages. I clicked on it and this guy goes, hey, man, and you spoke to him. His name's Justin. You spoke to him on the phone. Um, I'm in the restaurant working. Everything's going great. I answer a message and it says, hey, man. My brother and I are from the same little town you are in Kentucky, but we live in Fort Lauderdale now and we have a treatment center down here. We'd love for you to come visit. So I tell, you know, we'll get your plane ticket and hotel. And I told my girlfriend, I was like, look, I got one of these nut jobs in my inbox that's telling me they're (laughs) going to fly me to Florida and put me in a hotel. She said, well, we've been needing a vacation. Why don't we just say yes and just take the vacation from them, even if they're full of crap or whatever. And I said, "Okay." I said, sure, buddy. I'd love to come see your treatment center. What's up? 20 minutes later, I had plane tickets and a hotel book. And I went down and those are now my business partners, right? They were already operating. Uh, one of them has been sober longer than me. And one of them's just a year behind me. But anyway, so I flew down, I visited, I saw that they were running an abstinence based facility. They don't prescribe medication. Um, it, it wasn't a clinic or anything like that. It was a treatment center with 12 step recovery attached on abstinence based model. They did things the way I believed in abstinent. And while I was down there, they made me a job offer that I could not refuse. And they got me out of working in a kitchen, in a restaurant. And that has now, that was almost three years ago. We're about, June will be three years ago that happened. I had 3,000 followers at the time. And I've gone from just uh, an outreach coordinator to one of their national outreach coordinators and the social media director of the company. And we have three locations, like I said, Fort Lauderdale, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And then aside from that, myself and the guy that originally messaged me, Justin, we are city council approved. We have seven acres right up the street here, and we're building a 25,000 square foot inpatient medical detox and residential care facility with 50 beds, state of the art, um, the way we want it from the ground up. Wow. You, your parents must be, uh, they must be incredibly proud. Oh, man. I got to tell you, like, I, I'm just blessed, Mark. I don't know why, man. Why, do I, why did I get this? Why did I get it? And some people don't. 
Why do I have friends that went to the same place I went to and they're dead now? Uh, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Uh, all, all glory to my higher power. There's something else in this universe that's uh, controlling the bingo besides me. You had a and different I, purpose, my friend. You were here to help and people. Just, yeah. And, you know, um, it, it really did start off. It, it's not like I was like, I'm going to go out and make a video and, and then I'm going to get paid for it. That was not it. My original goal was maybe I can say a few things out here that'll get someone else out of the gutter, just another person. It. And it's turned into thousands of people as a team. I'm not, I don't, I have a team that we work around now. There's five of us, including Matt Bradley from Deadliest Catch, Marty Norman and Brian Kendrick up in Indiana, Phil Chalmers, who is a TV crime writer. He's a police trainer and Justin, who you spoke to. We're all on the same team now. We do nationwide outreach. And we help as many people as we can, whether they, but if they can go to a private facility, great. But if they have Medicaid or nothing, we also have Medicaid options all over the country. And we have a couple of free options for those that are right where I was, where you have absolutely nothing. And you throw your hands up and say, I'll get on a bus. I had a guy get on a bus and go from California to Kentucky the other day. It took him five days dope sick. And he's here now in a free place. I love it. I right love now. it. So, so tell me, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, okay, so that's my name, jamesweezy.com. You can go there. There's a little video about me on there. But uh, I guess the most popular way is at jamesweezy with the word live, L-I-V-E. That's on all social media platforms, particularly Facebook. That's my big one. So you go there. You can follow the page. Or there's a message button. You can send me a message directly right from Facebook um, or visit my website. I love it. All right. So I'm going to do my little sound off spiel. And then don't go anywhere, okay? Mm-hmm. So, all right, so guys, I hope you, this was a great show. I say that every week, but because we've had so many amazing guests, but this was definitely one for the books. So look, uh, if you need to get a hold of James or you want to talk to me, uh, you can find us on, we're on the drug and alcohol attorneys.com website. We have Facebook, drug and alcohol attorneys. There's the Mark Chiasta Facebook. We're on Instagram, YouTube. I think we're on Twitter too. Um, and if you just Google my name, I'm pretty sure that you'll you'll find us. So you can just email me, mark at drugandalcoholattorneys.com or call us, 561-419-6095. Hey, James, do you have a phone number, by the way, to give out? Uh, it's uh, 561-402-9134. You can shoot me a text message or what, start a conversation, no problem. Awesome. All right, guys, until next week, thank you for joining us at the, uh, the Journey Live. Ah!